Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kimes. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe on our website at thetwotestaments.com, where you can find our library of episodes and donate to support our work. Follow us also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture. I'm Ronnie Cosman. And I'm Will Collins. And in this episode, we're looking at the book of Micah, and we're joined today by Dr. Mark Geniliat. Did I say that right, Mark? That was, that, I liked it a lot. Was that pretty good? Is that no, Gignilliat? It's had that sort of French, uh, <laughs> uh, I like that. Genilet. Genilet. Yeah. Okay. You know, being from Canada, you know, we, we, uh, I yes. want to, I want to find the French where I can find uh, I, it. But I, no. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> so Mark Genilet is professor of divinity and director of the brand new PhD program here at Beeson Divinity School, where we are recording this episode in front of a live studio audience. Audience. So if our live studio audience would like to make themselves heard at this point, go for it. Thank you for all, all of you for being here this morning. Now, uh, Mark is the author of several books, including Reading Scripture Canonically, Theological Insights for Old Testament Interpretation, and Micah in the International Theological Commentary, which is why we thought of inviting him to guide us through the book of Micah today. Also other books and books forthcoming. Do you have anything coming out soon that we should know about, Mark? Oh, uh, Heath Thomas and I, I don't know if you, you all know Heath, have been um, working on a book for way too long with Baker Academic, which will be a theological introduction to the Old Testament. Um, so the, all the writing is in. So Lord, Lord willing, that plane will take off within the next year. Great. Yeah. And Heath is a, another contributor to the podcast this season. Uh, and so you can look out for the episode with him. Is he as doing well. Habakkuk with you all? He is doing yeah. Habakkuk oh, with us. Yeah. Or as he would say, Habakkuk. Yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah. Mark, what first sparked your interest in the book of Micah or the book of the 12, however you first got to Micah? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I like the Bible. Right? So, I mean, I think every, every corner of the Bible has its own fascination. I, I would love to give a, a little bit more of an interesting story than I have. Truth be told, new commentary series coming out. I'm friends with the um, the editors of this commentary series, and they, they asked me initially to do Isaiah, and so they gave me a contract on Isaiah, and I that that thing sat on my desk for about a month, and and I I just I'd never written a commentary before, didn't know what the genre was like, and I thought, boy, 66 chapters in Isaiah, <laughs> what if I get to chapter five and I don't, you know, this is not working, so I. I I, uh, I threw the threw it back to them and said let, let let me give Micah a go and and we'll see how this works so that that's how it started but I, I will say the whole process of writing a commentary um, it's a, I, I mean, in some sense it might be what I, how I've heard people to describe being a pilot you know it's hours of monotony interspersed with moments of sheer terror um, and I, I think that's kind of the, the nature of it so so Micah got got into my imagination just by the study of it. Great. Well, hopefully we can get to some of those terrifying parts of Micah in our discussion <laughs> <today. We'll> see. <laughs> But before we get into the actual text of Micah, what we'd like to do is just contextualize it a little bit. Yeah. And this is probably not a book of the Bible that a lot of people are very familiar with, uh, besides Micah 6, 8, right? So we want to try right, and contextualize right. the rest of the, the book. The sticker verse. That's yes, right. right. Uh, <laughs> so starting with, what is the historical context of Micah? What do we know about who wrote the book, when, and why? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, this is, you know, Micah raises lots of fun questions about this. And of course, you know, the critical tradition will engage Micah in its own way. And I, I don't know how far you all can sort of direct out that, that conversation. Um, verse one, the superscription does set the book within a particular context. And if you, if you look, for example, the ways in which the first six books of the Minor Prophets run, it's kind of got this interesting move from prophet to the north, prophet to the south, north, south, north, south with Micah coming in here at book number six. Um, so Micah is a, a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. He prophesies middle um, of the eighth century to the end of that century. This is in the period, historically speaking, of the kind of renaissance of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, tiglath pileser III, and then as things sort of move on, uh, eventually uh, resulting in the destruction of the northern kingdom. So we, you, you, he's living in a, in a cataclysmic moment. Um, and he's also identifies himself from this region called the Shvela, which is this plains region between the mountains of Judah, the Judean hills and the Mediterranean Sea. 
Um, and there's a lot of that's been traded off of that, you know, because Micah is this sort of lowland, uh, you know, country prophet, and I, Isaiah is this gentrified kind of royal prophet. So the, the, the form critical instincts to let that kind of background material inform um, have led to all kinds of interesting, I think maybe misguided, but interesting reading. So that you have basically, as, as I'll tell the students here at Beeson, you know, Micah is kind of from Jemison or Jasper. This is all, all Alabama references here, but it's some country town. And, and Isaiah, you know, he, he went to Harvard and he's, you know, he's kind of, so, so you, ha- you have that kind of p- at plague at work. I, I, I think there's just a lot um, that we don't know about Micah the prophet. That's what's fascinating about the book. We don't really know the man. Um, he will appear at the end of, I mean, in the middle of, of chapter one. He'll appear again later on where, where he compares and contrasts himself with the false prophets. But we don't know a lot about him. I think you all interviewed Chris Seitz recently. Is that right? Um, Chris wrote an article years ago, a catchy, a catchy phrase for the title was, on letting, on letting the text act like a man. And I think this is probably my own canonical instincts in reading Micah. And instead of pressing through Micah to get to the real prophet back there to hear the crackle of his voice and the crooked finger pointing, we, we let the man be shaped by the book itself. And that's, that's the way in which, we, in which we engage it. So, so who is Micah? Micah is these seven chapters right here. Right. Now, what are the major themes in the book of Micah? If you could identify your top two, top three... Or however ambitious you want to be, you know, how, what would, how would you kind of... I'll give you uh, 7.5. <laughs> summarize them for um, us. Uh, you know, Cal- in Calvin's commentary on Micah, and I, I trade on this in my own work. It's kind of funny, by the way. You'll, you want me to know how this works. But I had to go back and, and look at my own commentary to remember what my own thoughts were on these things. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed by that, actually. Um, but, but Calvin's commentary on Micah talks about um, chapter 1 and chapter 2 um, being an engagement from the prophet on the two tables of the law. You know, lo- love the Lord your God with all your heart, table one. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the, and the necessary interrelation of those two. You can't, you can't have the one without the other. The prophets lean heavily, and all the prophets lean heavily into that particular dynamic. Loving God, loving neighbor on a continuum of some necessary mutual reciprocity. Um, and so I think that's probably the major theme. Um, and you're going to ask me, I think, eventually at some point, probably I, I would guess about the structure of the book. Um, but the structure of the book and its major themes are probably laid out in the first three chapters. I mean, there they are. Um, and it's about idolatry, so we're dealing here with table one. It's about injustice, chapter two. There's table two of the law. And then chapter three just ups the ante and reintroduces both of those themes in, in highly provocative ways. Um, so the themes of loving God and loving your neighbor seem to be um, co- covenant reminders to the people of God in terms of their own infidelity, I think, as, as kind of the, the driving pulse and uh, heartbeat of this book. So as you anticipated, we are going to ask you about the structure of the book yes. right now. Mm-hmm. So could you briefly summarize the book and how it fits together? How does it progress? Uh, and, and this is, this a, as everything is, this is controversial. I mean, people, people have wrestled with the internal coherence of Micah in, in different ways. I mean, even going back to the critical dr- tradition in the late 19th century, Bernard Stada writes an article at the end of the 19th century basically saying you only find the authentic Micah in the first three chapters. And we, we all know kind of how that critical line of, of reasoning goes. Um, I, I'll say there are several different ways that people have tried to organize the book. You'll find, for example, the call to hear or to obey, Shema, which of course has its own significant Deuteronomic resonances throughout the Old Testament. That sort of marks the beginning of chapter 1. That also marks chapter 3. You hear it again at the beginning of chapter 6. So some people allow that tripartite structure to be the organizing influence. Others see the sort of ABAB pattern of judgment and uh, then salvation with chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have a tripartite view. My, I, I was struck, and I just sort of went with it because I thought it worked. Jorg Jeremias wrote a, a commentary, German commentary on, on Micah that I just think is fantastic. And Again, Jeremias picks up on the, the core element of chapters one through three. I think we've talked, the major themes are already laid out for you there. Um, and then chapters four through five reintroduce those themes. That's a kind of extension of the themes that you have in the first three chapters. And interestingly enough, chapters six through seven don't build off of four and five. In some sense, they too, in their own way, reintroduce the themes of one through three. Um, so you have this, uh, the technical term that, that uh, scholars use as a kind of Fort Schreibungen. You have this extension that's used here between the first three chapters that then 
influence four and five, and then also influence six and seven in their own way. So that's I, that 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 got my own imagination, and I, I I wouldn't go to the guillotine over that particular structure. I mean, if you push me in a corner, I'm like, sure, I change my mind. But but I think that kind of helps uh, organize the book. Now, how do you see Micah fitting into the Book of the Twelve as a whole? Uh, I mean, different <laughs> people we've interviewed and asked about the individual books. You know, some of the you know some scholars want to just treat each book on its own individually. You know, not really as let's say uh, substantially part of the twelve, but they want to treat each one as its own kind of you know witness writing. Um, others that we've interviewed really want to see the, uh, certain editorial things that have happened or ways in which that the particular book ties into the other, uh, 11 books. How do you see that working out and how does Micah, you know, in particular relate to the other books of the 12? Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear what the other people have to say on this. Uh, um, I, I think at this point in time, I'm, I'm, I'm a both and guy. In other words, I'd, I'd want to engage in each of the books within the book of the 12 within their own literary integrity. In other words, I think they work on their own and can, and frankly, that's the way in which these books have been received primarily in the history of reception in the church and the synagogue on, the, on their own voice. At the same time, I do think this resurgence of interest in thinking about intercanonical conversations um, are fascinating. It's not really an old conversation. I, my, my own colleague who just retired, Paul House, was one of the first um, to sort of, you know, make a, you know, voyage into this area to think about how the Book of the Twelve might be talking to itself internally. And admittedly, for some, it's, it's you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder sort of thing. I mean, how persuasive one could be, um, how one can link that to intentionality, I think is a question that's raised for people. Like, how, is this really intended that way? Um, I just finished lecturing on this to students here at Beeson in my Old Testament theology class. I think some of them are here in the audience. Um, and I do think there are ways in which the end of these books can tip and tuck into one another. We see that especially in the, in the front end of the 12, the way in which the Medot, those attributes of the Lord in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more today at some point in time, they weave their way through the books in a way that seem to be, um, like, for example, Joel 2 and Jonah. It's like, oh, my goodness, the, the king of Nineveh is using covenantal language based on the Medot of Exodus 34. It's like, ah, you know, that, what's going on? Um, so there are, I think, very interesting ways to think about the, how the 12 is in conversation with one another and how it, the 12 is more than just the sum of its parts. So, um, and, I, and, and Micah is, is actually such an interesting test case in that uh, because in the redaction critical world, Micah, and this again, everything's contested, this is contested, but, but Micah is a part of the so-called original four on which the whole edifice is built, right? So Micah is an earlier prophet. So if you're thinking chronologically, you'd want it to be something like Hosea and then Amos and then Micah. He, he needs to be up here, and yet he's down the road here at book number six. That, that to me is fascinating. Like, okay, so that's a kind of paradigmatic question. Why here and not there? Uh, my own instinct on this, and again, you know, it, whether or not this is persuasive, people have to re wrestle with it. Micah's placement between... Um, Nahum and Jonah, to me, is actually really instructive now, because we've got a, a, a real live tension on our hands with the presentation of, this, of the Ninevites. I mean, if we, if we leave it on the surface, the question that I think everyone wants to ask is, will the real Nineveh please stand up? Is it Jonah's Nineveh who repented? Is it, and, and, I, and I tell the students here, Beeson, if you, if you want to add a historical narrative um, that the Ninevites repented in mass and then they backslid and then you have Nahum, where God comes in as a line of judgment against the Ninevites. If, if, if that helps you sleep at night, like, I want you to have it. Like, take, take it and sleep. <laughs> the, unfortunately, the Bible doesn't say anything about that kind of narrative. What you have are two radically different portrayals of the Ninevites. And here's Micah right in between navigating for us two very different options for the nations eschatologically vis-a-vis -vis the covenant God of Israel. And so it seems to me like Micah is hermeneutically helping us think through um, what's the future of the nations with respect to the God of Israel? Well, for the repentant nations that turn to him, who are part of the mass of Micah 4, who are moving toward Mount Zion to be taught by the Lord, you get Jonah's and none of that. That's, waiting, that's the character of God waiting for you. For those who reject, the so-called anti-elect, um, the judgment of God is, is your future as well. So I think Micah can help adjudicate what seems to be a kind of complicated uh, portrait there within the twelve. I think that's by intent, but yeah. 
Right. And for listeners who want to dig more deeply into the way that the canonical presentation of the books of the Bible may influence their interpretation, your reading scripture canonically is a really helpful resource for that. And particularly for the prophets, we've already mentioned Chris Seitz, but his Prophecy and Hermeneutics is a fascinating book in this regard because the point he makes is, and this reflects on some of the conversations we've had with other guests, is, well, when you look in the Bible, the prophets are in a certain order. But if you look on many library shelves, they've been put into a historical order or as or when they're dealt with in an Old Testament introduction. Right. So we've reordered them because we prioritize what we understand of history over what the, the canon presents to us. And that just changes the way that we read the text and what we draw from them. And you've pointed out one example of how if we read Micah where it is it opens new avenues of interpretation, particularly in between Jonah and Nahum. I think I saw somewhere, and I I can't remember for sure where it was, so if if you need to edit this, have at it. But I think there's some like chronological Bible coming out right now or something like that where they're refitting the whole Bible according to a historical chronology. I'll just say like that, that stuff makes me sweat. Uh, yeah. like my canonical sensibility is like, hold, you know, <laughs> hold on. Like God has a perspective on time that he's given us here. We, we might want to stick with that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it as one way of reading scripture. And, and these kind of chronological Bibles are actually fairly popular. Uh, are but, they? I see, I don't, I, yeah. yeah. Well, probably not with you, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we have to understand it as one way, which is actually taking it out of the context in which it is given to us by by the tra- the tradition. Uh, and speaking of the reception of the text and yeah. how that influences our reading, could you talk a little bit about the reception of Micah? What are some of the persistent issues in Micah's history of interpretation? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I should be able to put my finger on this a little bit better, but um, the the some of the ch- persistent challenging issues of Micah really are the details. I mean, it's it's the, just the nature of any kind of thing that you begin to go beyond the surface level, and especially engaging the text in, in the original language, you begin to see like there there are some real challenges here. Um, I remember when I was working on Micah, um, I assigned to my Hebrew three class just because I knew I needed to work through it. Like we're going to work through through Micah, and we got. Um, to the first chapter and beginning in verse 10, the, the syntax of verse verse 10 and following where you have all these cities within the Shvei law that are being used in poetic ways, it's it's an absolute disaster. I mean, it's, it's a mess. Uh, and here I have these Hebrew three, like this is their first go at Hebrew. I'm like, I, and I just said, I'm really sorry. Like, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, so I think there are, just, there are challenges in the details. I think those are persistent issues. Um, I think sorting through, um, and, and I, I put a, a you know, I put a flag on this in my own reading in Micah 2, but sorting through Micah's own engagement with the false prophets in Micah 2 is a very difficult thing. Um, so, for example, you have something like, do, do not preach, they preach, they will not preach this. Well, if you're in an English class, you would, you would minus 10 points everywhere for unclear antecedents. Like, who are the pronouns referring to here? And so I just think that the details of the text require a certain kind of patience to see like what's going on. Um, but the truth be told, the challenges with a book like Micah uh, beyond the details, uh, for me, it's kind of like Mark, Mark Twain's famous line. You know, it's not the parts that I don't understand that trouble me. It's the parts that I do. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I think the, the claims that Micah are making that Micah is making on its readers are total in terms of covenantal fidelity. God wants all of us, and he wants all of us in terms of our affection and our covenant keeping with him and the way in which that influences how we engage those around us. So that that's just, a, you know, we're, we're, I'm very sort of Lutheran in my view here. We're at the same time righteous and just and, and just, I mean, sinner and just. So we're, we will wrestle with, I think, the internal dynamics of what Micah claims on us till the day that we die. Yeah. And th- I mean, there is also the quotation of Micah 5, 2 in the Gospels, which we'll get to later and sure. how that's understood. Uh, and But then turning in terms of the history of reception to the present day, are there particular issues that you think Micah speaks to today in which it's a helpful resource for people? Yeah. Um, well, you know, obviously the the issue of idolatry and the affections and the, des- the desires of the heart are perennial issues within the life of the church and the faith. Um, I mean, our, our students here, and I'm sure the students, the undergrads as well, will read Augustine. I mean, the ordering of our affections, our 
our tendency to take that which is good and turn it into that which is ultimate, our tendency to swap the creator for the creature, I mean, that is endemic to our fallen nature. And we, um, and I, in some sense, sort of the Christian existence is itself a wrestling with the proper ordering of our desires again and again and again. Um, so in that sense, so Micah sits in the front porch of our, of our Christian existence. So I think that's a very uh, crucial factor uh, of his ongoing uh, significance. The, the other thing too is, um, and this is where Micah and Jeremiah become fun canonical partners with one another. You know, Micah comes to Jeremiah's rescue in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is about to be put to death. Um, and one of the elders says, and this is a rare thing in the prophets, but one of the, the elders says, didn't Micah back in the day say something very similar to this? And he didn't get killed. And so, so, so Micah canonically comes to the rescue for Jeremiah. And both Micah and Jeremiah in their engagement with the false prophets are swimming in a very similar stream. And that is, and it's a very sort of simple thing, but every false prophet, can we just say even heretic in the life of the church, has Bible verses on their side. That's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, but they've all got some Bible on their side so that when Hananiah and some of these other false prophets who are saying, here, hey, this, is, this thing's not as bad as it seems to be in, my, in, in Micah 2, they're, they're deploying, a, a, at least some would argue, a, a, a half-baked Zion theology, right? And in other words, Zion will never be shaken. And here's the deal. Like, we can go to Bible verses to prove that that's true. Like Psalm 46, a mighty fortress is our God, Psalm 48. So this Zion theology that's at play in the Bible, we will not be shaken. Um, they are appealing to that, and it's as if Micah and Jeremiah and the other prophetic um, company is coming and say, but don't forget, you know, there's that whole book of Deuteronomy as well. And that, that whole tradition of blessing and cursing. So the tendency that we all have, I think, within the life of the church, both individually and corporately to be selective, um, you know, this is that whole sort of Jonathan Haidt thing on our righteous mind, our, our moral and religious imaginations more often than not are driven by our gut and our intuition. I think we're hardwired that way. David Hume was probably right. All right, so we're, we're driven by our gut and our intuition, and then we come in to look for arguments to support what our basic gut and instincts are. Um, and I, I think this is where the prophetic legacy is so strong in the life of the church to, to warn us about trusting our own gut and intuition and to also recognize our tendency to be limited or at least to go to those quarters of Scripture that we prefer over against others. Hmm. Um, I'm in the Anglican world, um, for good or for ill, but I am. Uh, one of the articles of religion, uh, Article 20, says that the church has authority, but it cannot um, teach the Bible as if one section of the Bible is repugnant to another. Hmm. Um, and I think that's the, the prophets are wrestling with that. Okay, you've got that tradition, but the Zion theology has to be wedded to a larger covenantal theology as well. And that's a, that's a dynamic that's at play. Yeah. One other question I would have on the history of interpretation is you mentioned Micah 6, 8 is on bumper stickers and things like that. And we'll get into that text in a little more detail in a minute. But is that something that's been consistent throughout uh, the history of the church that Micah 6, 8 is privileged as a kind of summary of what is expected of people? I hadn't prepared you for this question, no, so uh, sorry. But you know, it's a good question. I, I don't really know. That, I, I don't want to answer that question in any sort of definitive way. But it's not standout. I mean, I don't think it has that kind of bumper sticker quality within the tradition. So it, it probably yeah. wasn't on the back of chariots back in Jerusalem. No, no. <laughs> and it's not like you're you're reading. Uh, so I, I did this with students years ago. Where we worked through Micah, and we kind of compared and contrasted Calvin's commentary with his sermons. On Micah, and it's not like you get to Micah six and all the and the Calvin's like the day you've been waiting for. I mean, <laughs> the verse you all know. So I, I don't, I don't get that sense in the yeah. Okay. This choruses, right? I mean, we we know he has shown you. I mean, we we know these choruses oh, yeah. and that stuff. You know, gets your imagination. Yeah. Mark, what for you is the most difficult thing to understand about the Book of Micah? Uh, chapter two. I think that's a chapter. I mean, the the whole nature of the of false prophecy over against Micah's claim to genuine prophecy and, and figuring out who's saying what. I think just interpretively, that's a challenge. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of Micah is on the surface. You know, I'm, I realize that there's a lot of background canonical or social religious construction that people will sort of lay into this and that, that raises its own kind of interpretive complication. So I'm not saying that, that Micah is easy in terms of the history of reception. But the basic matters that Mike is dealing with here are, are kind of on the surface. I mean, it's love God, love your neighbor. 
um, justice matters. If you're if you're in the context of worshiping the living God, while involved in active acts of oppression, that that's incongruous. These things cannot work. Um, Micah six eight. It's kind of funny we just mentioned this, but Micah six eight, the call to justice, and maybe we'll come back to this. But that to me, um, you know, to see the the background of Micah six eight, beginning in verse one, where you have God's announcement of their redemption, and it's very much sort of backdropped against uh, the Decalogue. Um, I've redeemed you, and because I've redeemed you, I'm, and so this is somewhat controversial, but I think it's it's a kind of Old Testament dynamic. God's grace and redemption always precedes the giving of the law, right? So it's it's an ontology, it's, an, it's a being, um, in, in, I, you, we'll use Christian language, in Christ, that then motivates the call toward the life of a living into his lordship. So I think those dynamics are very much at play, but but I think the surface stuff is is uh, where one has to wrestle. Great. Well, let's get into the text itself. Okay. And let's start with Micah 1-2. Uh, here, the text begins with a proclamation. Hear, you peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So we have this address to all of the peoples and the earth. And the text goes on to describe how the Lord will come down and he'll tread on the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt and the valleys burst open. But then we have in verse five, it's presented as if this apparent universal judgment is, quote, for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. So what's going on here? Yeah. Uh I'm, I should have mentioned this, like the hard stuff. Like, here's one. <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> That's our goal is to get into those hard places. <laughs> Every turn, there is there are these sort of challenges. Yeah, it's um, it's not self evident how one navigates through this, and that and and part of the challenge, of course, is the nature, the language in verse five, which links all of this cosmic judgment to the sin that's happening with um, Jerusalem and Samaria. Uh, I I. I think I think part of the dynamic here that's at play is this interaction between the cosmic and the global, um, the universal and the particular. Um, Israel is called to be a kind of sanctifying presence to the nations, um, a kingdom of priests, so that you see their call to be a display people to the world, actually having its missional salvific effect on the people. So there's a, there's a missional identity within the Old Testament of Israel's being. So her actual election has within it this kind of missional dynamic. And when Israel's operating outside of that, you see the implications of that cosmically. So I think that's one way of thinking through, at least conceptually, how to link what seems to be on the surface something incongruous. There's a, there's a move, though, that's made. If you look in chapter 5, and this is a very minor prophetish kind of thing to do, where um, in verse 10, it begins this language of declaration um, against Jacob, right? So verse 8, the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations. Verse 10, in that day, declares the Lord, I'll cut off your horses. Whose horses? Jacob's horses, your chariots, your land, your strongholds, your, your, your. And then you get to verse 15, and it says, and in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. You're like, Well, hold on. I thought we were talking about Jacob here. Um, Israel, or even an eponym for the whole of the United Monarchy, uh, what, how do we get to the nations? And it's as if all the minor prophets say, yes. Right? I mean, the, um, Isaiah, for example, all the oracles against the nations, the Babylonians, the Moabites, and then what is it? Jerusalem's in there too. Amos 1 and 2, for three sins, yea, four, I'll go against Damascus. And you're working through, yeah, go get Damascus, go get Moab, go get Ammon. But then what happens? Well, there's Jerusalem and Israel as well. So the question about who are the friends and the enemies of God um, within the minor prophets is, is, a, is a complicated dynamic. It's, it's not self-evident on the surface so that you have this interaction between Israel and all of the nations being one of the nations when they're acting out of accord with the covenant. That's part of the dynamic that's at play here as well. Yeah, as I was reading back through Micah to prepare for this episode, it struck me that the interaction between the universal and the particular Yeah in Micah is particularly tense. Yeah. Uh, But it's not always negative. It's negative here in chapter one, and we'll continue to talk about that. But it has positive aspects as well, which we'll get to later. Do you, let me ask you a quick question here on verse uh, three. For the Lord is coming out of his his place 
and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Uh, and then earlier in verse two, um, the Lord is coming from his holy temple. You, t- you take that to be like his, um, like the, the heavenly temple that he's coming down out of, or he's coming out of the temple in Jerusalem to bring judgment. Like what's the, yeah. Well, this is all, um, borrowing sort of theophanic imagery here. So you have this, the, 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 na- the nature of the Lord coming to step onto a high place. There's also, I think, a kind of double entendre here, the bemote uh, of the high places of the earth. Of course, the kings of Judah and Israel are, um, you know, they're held accountable in terms of whether or not they allow the high places to stand. So there's a, there's a kind of double entendre here about the theophanic nature of God's revelation of himself in these mountainous regions. So there's something about mountains in the Bible. It's not an accident that the transfiguration happens on a mountain. Mm-hmm. These are those sort of, th- or the Mount Sinai, these are the thin places. And he's stepping his foot down in judgment. But where, where that's coming from, the temple of heaven, I think that's probably the working assumption here, the cosmic temple. But that's kind of fun in Isaiah 6 too, mm-hmm. right? Where you, th- you have Isaiah having a vision of the Lord in the temple. And you ask the question, well, where is Isaiah in the temple here? Or is he in the te- heavenly temple? I think the answer is, Yes. You know, we've, we've got a continuum here that's happening in ways that, uh, as I tell the students in, in my classes here, you've got to have some sort of science fiction imagination to be able to think through the physical dynamics of the interaction of the, the heavenly temple and the earthly temple. Great. Now, chapter one goes on to say in verse nine that Judah's wound is incurable. And then the rest of the chapter laments Judah's judgment. And then chapter two continues that theme of judgment until suddenly in two verse 12, the text promises restoration, right? We read, I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture. It will resound with people. So how should we understand that abrupt change, you think? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the the, the prophets operate that way. I mean, again, the there's a lot of work that's been done on what the nature of this actual incurable wound is. And I, I realize that we, we could chase that and I won't. Um, but the wound that we're talking about here is the wound of God's judgment, which probably also entails the actions leading to it. So both the judgment and the actions that have left now the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria and rubble never to be re- restored. That now, that whole entourage has come into the southern kingdom as well. And, and both the actions that led to the wound and the wounding of God's judgment itself have moved into the southern kingdom. And that, when, you, when you say the actions, you mean like the, the idolatry of the people? Idolatry, yeah. yeah. And of course, we know in the northern kingdom, they, they never had a, had a righteous king at all. So the, 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 the whole um, edifice of, of northern worship was idolatrous from the get-go, the calves, and et cetera. So you have that dynamic here at play, and it's basically, it happened up there. Jeremiah says similar things. If, if it happened at Shiloh, it can happen here too. Don't, don't get overly excited about being in Jerusalem. God's judgment can come. That's the, the, the warning that the prophet's giving here. But this is the character of the prophets. They, the, the revelation of God is such that he, he strikes down, and he strikes down in order to raise up again. This is John Levinson's famous book, The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son. That's the character of our God to wound in order to heal. Isaiah 1, the whole head down to the foot is incurably ill, and yet God strikes down his son in order to raise up his son. So those those dynamics, that kind of judgment, salvation, whiplash that you feel Mm -hmm. throughout the prophets, that's that to me is ingredient to the whole thing, revealing again the character of God to strike and to make alive. Mm -hmm. So then in chapter 3, Micah goes after the leaders of the people. So he addresses the rulers and the prophets, but then in Micah three eight we get one of those few moments you mentioned where Micah himself appears in the book and it says, "But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin." So, what's the contrast being presented here between Micah and his message and what the rulers and the prophets are saying to the people? Yeah, I mean, and and this is where Micah three. Um, fills out the themes that are already presented in one and two, but does so in this really provocative way, describes, I mean, he starts in chapter three with, shouldn't the leaders know justice? I mean, of all the people, it's this sort of trickle down Zion theology, right? Where the Lord sets apart these leaders who then take the beneficence that the Lord gives them and then delivers it to the people. I mean, that's that's the idea. Like of all the people that should know justice, it's the it's the royal, it's the royal class and and the religious class. I mean, the political and the religious religious class should know this. Um, and then he uses the imagery of cannibalism. I mean, it's like, 
brace your, you know, so don't don't take that to the beach for beach reading. You know, brace yourself here. Yeah, that's in cha- in verse two, yeah, right? That's horrible. You want to read it? Yeah, let's read it. Uh, oh yeah, this is fun. <laughs> should you should you not know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off my people and the flesh off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off them, break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a kettle, like flesh in a cauldron. Now, is that you take that to be metaphorical, as in like they're well, they're, bas- so. they're basically <laughs> yeah. eating up the people? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but but metaphorical, not in not in a not in any way to dismiss the force of it, but metaphorical to let you know the the horror. Sure. Because this is again, that's a sort of classic notion of metaphors, letting you into the reality itself in ways that you couldn't have without it. It's letting you see how how awful the injustice is. It's the cannibalization of the people of God for the powerful purpose of those who are in in those positions. Although we do have elsewhere in Micah where you get, uh, should I not offer my firstborn, uh, you know, for my transgression kind of thing. And now that I don't, again, is that like rhetorical or is that, you know, there was child sacrifice in the ancient near East. I mean, is we'll take that as hyperbolic hyperbolic. Okay. Um, because it's already an abomination, but the point is to compare and contrast at least in Micah six, that the nature of the people's willingness to do some sort of arbitration work with the Lord, like another will I'll, I'll, I can even bring my firstborn when he's asking for something that's much more costly in terms of, of um, total devotion to him and neighbor. Mm. I mean, people are always willing to write checks. Sure. Right? And I think that's the kind of idea. Like, I'll write a check, but no, no, I don't want, I, I want Romans 12. I want all of you. I mean, I think that's the dynamic. Sure. No, but back, back to your yeah, question. Sorry, here. Or, or you. Whoever asked the question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the comparing and the contrasting here is, and again, this is, sits on our day so much, and I, and I say this to the students here and to myself, Lord have mercy, if you think that you are impervious um, to the surrounding culture or the people within your congregation shaping what you say in light of the potential challenges that you might face with, not, with what you say not wanting to be heard, you are naive. We are all susceptible to that. And what we read in Micah 2 and, and as the move is in Micah 3, the false prophets are for hire. You, you want me to give you a good message? Well, then give me something to eat. Pay me off. Um, if you don't pay me off, then I'm going to give you a, a, a message of doom. You want wheel? Pay me. You want doom? Um, then don't pay me. So the prophets are for hire. Their messages are malleable. That's set over against the true prophet like Micah here who's saying, I, I'm driven by the Spirit of the Lord to teach and to preach that which God compels me to do. And the true prophets will kick and scream and moan about that. They're not often very happy about it, but they recognize they have been seized by something external to themselves and compelled to deliver something that's not pop, um, very popular. And you see the way in which Micah describes it here. What's the unpopular message? Well, I'm, I'm willing to talk about sin. Words, I'm willing to call, if I can use Lutheran terminology here, I'm willing to name the thing for what it is. Enough of these sort of religious platitudes we're going to go down and name the thing for what it is. And that that sets himself up over against those who are willing to kind of massage the message to whatever people are really wanting to hear. That 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 dynamic sits on and it's easy enough, you know, to you know to, to thump our chest on that. We we are all susceptible to those dynamics. Hmm. Uh, in chapter four, uh, there's a vision of a peaceful future, which I, I think is worth, you know, uh, reading in full, especially, you know, today, you know, lots of turbulent, violent oh, times. Lord have mercy. Um, yes. So let's read that. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. Peoples shall stream to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. So how do how, how do scholars interpret this vision of the exalted mountain of the Lord's house and then this influx of the peoples from many nations and what challenges do you know do we have in understanding the significance of this vision both in its context yeah. but then also maybe in the broader canonical yeah. context yeah it's again the location of Micah 4 um, in the overall book but within the 12 is interesting because 
you know, the Masoretes um, were their knowledge of textual detail sort of blows our hair back. I always tell <clears throat> the students who are beasting that when I grow up someday, I'd like to be a Masorete. You want to be one of these medieval uh, Jewish scribes? With modern, with penicillin, <laughs> like technique, I, I'd, I'd okay. go back. Um, but, uh, you know, you have, you have this sort of, um, remarkable detail uh, to the text. And if you go to Micah 3.12, you'll find like in the middle of it, one, you know, 18 point font, then one like 26 point font Hebrew letter. And then it lets you know that that's the middle letter of the 12. So not just Micah, the whole of the 12. So what's Micah 3.12? It's death. It's the destruction of Zion. So, so think about the dynamic that you have right at the core center of the 12. And I would say this is by intent. I don't know how they pulled it off, but I'll say by some sort of canonical intent, you have death and resurrection sitting right at the middle of the 12. Let me read 312 just so people have it in their oh, mind. Yeah. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Yeah. I mean, that's so that's the death. That's yeah. the death. Yeah. That's death. Yeah. So you have death. And then what do you have right after that? Resurrection. Zion shall be raised like a mountain and the nations will stream to it. Um, so we're scholars. I mean, the, the scholarly conversation on this is fascinating because you have almost a carbon copy of this in Isaiah chapter 2. Um, so you, you asked questions earlier about the whole history of the 12. Isaiah's influence on the canonical shaping of the 12, I think, is, is massive, and there's been a lot of work done on that. Um, and here we see one of those places where Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 share in common with one another what seems to be almost a carbon copy prophetic word. Um, there are some differences which are interesting to track out. And so the question that scholars ask is, well, who, who's borrowing from whom? And, and, and my own, you know, my own two cents on this is I think Isaiah is probably primary with, with Micah borrowing from this because of the last word that sentence that you read there, because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, that, that phraseology is phraseology only found in Isaiah. It's nowhere else in the prophets except for here in Micah chapter four. And what's interesting is that so-called, what the Germans call a Schluss formula, a, a final formula here, um, that it's not in Isaiah two. So there's something that's going on here. I don't know all the dynamics in terms of the, of the canonical shaping history on this. Um, but to me, that, that's a fascinating question that's being raised here. When you read this in light of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one identifies the rebellion of the people of God as, and I've, this has really got my imagination over the past month. I just taught a lay academy class here in Isaiah, but it's, so this, this is in me. Um, their rebellion in Isaiah 1 is identified as their lack of knowledge. They refuse to know who I am. I've revealed myself to them. They refuse to know who I am. What do you have in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4? In that future eschatological day when Zion is raised, what are the nations doing? The nations are streaming to Mount Zion. Why? to be taught, but they want to know. They want to know who the Lord is. They want to know his ways and what unfolds from that. What unfolds from that is an era of universal peace. Um, so, you know, M16s become John Deere tractors, right? I mean, uh, uh, swords become plowshares and pruning and spears become pruning hooks. And I mean, and it sounds so idyllic, probably I think for maybe 23 year olds, a little boring, you know, like, so here's the eschatological day you get to eat your own figs and drink your own wine without any fear like that. That might not sound all that compelling as you age. That sounds fantastic. Right. Mm. Um, but the point is this, this era of universal peace in the future that's built off of the knowledge of the Lord, like the waters that cover the sea. Now the controversy of this right here is verse five. So you didn't read verse five. A lot of scholars today see verse five as basically this portrayal in the future of religious pluralism. So let's uh, read that. For all the peoples yeah. walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Yes. So um, many scholars today, scholars that I really respect, will see verse 5 as ingredient to that larger eschatological vision. 
Um, I, I, I don't. I, so, actually, that, so that Israel worships Israel's God, God and, and the then the people in this time of peace. Yeah, so here they, comes they Nimrod and Baal, gods, right, and all right. the gods are kind of getting along. Right. I mean, so that, I, I just, that's for a lot of reasons, it'd be hard, hard sure. for me to swallow. Well, it, I mean, one of the reasons why, why, why do scholars, will they go to Deuteron- is it Deuteronomy, uh, is it 28 or 32, whatever it is? Where a God is allotted to the to each of the sons of God, you know, a nation, yeah, something like that. Thing, yeah, I don't, I don't know if they'll do that. I mean, okay. I think it's more of just this is part of the this is one of the ways in which Micah has a vision of the future that's different than Isaiah. I mean, they'll they'll point there. So, uh, I think Marvin Sweeney will talk about a debate between Isaiah and Micah, right? Okay. Kind of on this point. I think that concluding formula for the mouth of the Lord has spoken is important. I think that brings an end. Which comes right before this. Right before verse, that yeah. to the future vision. And, and if you follow chapter 4 into chapter 5, there's this movement from future day to atta, now. Future day, now. Future day, now. Um, I think verse 5 is bringing us back into the current day. And I, I actually don't read this as causal for the da 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 I actually read it as concessive. Although the nations continue to walk in their gods, we will continue to walk in the name of our, of, our, of our Lord, which would be on analogy to what Micah does in Isaiah chapter 2. Come now, uh, O Jacob, let us, let us reason together. So that, 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 that's a controversial matter. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you spoke about uh, the resonance of that phrase in there about uh, sitting under their own vines and under their own fig trees. With no fear. With no fears, which, which um, has been somewhat famously um, put into the Hamilton musical. Uh, and I did a little oh. research on it. And actually the reason it makes it into Hamilton is because it was used over and over again by Washington actually. Oh. Uh, and so in these moments in which there is a lot of violence and war surrounding this, you know, this resonates. And so this is another one of those times right now, unfortunately, where there's a lot of violence and war in the world. And so Micah speaks into this moment. Now, another passage that is well known from Micah is Micah 5, 2, right? And so this is this prophecy about Bethlehem that Christians often hear quoted around Christmas time. And it says, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. So how do we understand that verse in Micah? So Christians tend to focus on what it means in Matthew 2, 5 to 6, where it's quoted, but how is it? It's quoted quoted there in order to kind of, uh, Herod's trying to find the location, right, where... Mm -hmm. um, the Messiah is going to be born. Great. Yeah. Thanks, okay. New Testament expert. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we like the New Testament. It, it made the cut for a reason. That's good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what role is it playing in Micah first before we talk about the role that it's playing in Matthew? And how do those, how do those relate? Well, I mean, I, again, I think it sits on the issues that we've already been talking about. So you have an obvious moment right now within the 8th century that's disruptive geopolitically. Right. I mean, the, the, the Assyrians are a bad group. Um, and they and you read this in Micah chapter 1, when they eventually under um, Sennacherib make their move into Judah under the reign of Hezekiah, um, we, we know the story about God's miraculous deliverance of Jerusalem. But what we often forget is the massive damage done to the infrastructure of Judah in the south that really they never recovered from. Lachish, um, famous bronze relief, I think, in the British Museum of Sennacherib forcing the generals of Lake East to bow in abeyance to him. That's that's that'd be like you know the Pentagon going down in the U.S. So the so the significance of the cataclysmic moment forced the people of God to hope eschatologically for the future. So again, you have that movement between the now and the then that continues to kind of pepper here. That seems to be the dynamic that's at play here as well. There there will be a future ruler that will come. We might not know peace right now, but he will be our peace. I mean, there, this, the judgment that we're experiencing right now of God is not his final word. It's instrumental to his ultimate resurrection. I and mean, I think that's the dynamic at play within Micah. So Matthew is reading this very much in keeping with its original. Yeah. Context. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, but part of the challenge with, with, and again, I, I, I'm, you all know my approach to all this. So I mean, I, I, I can't read the Bible. Don't think anyone really should. who's a Christian outside of some sort of Trinitarian metaphysics. So in other words, I'm, as I, as I tell the students, I'm not waiting for Matthew for God to become triune. I mean, this is, this is his eternal being. So we're always making a distinction in my own mind between what biblical authors might have known and the actual reality of God's being. Those should not be fused with one another. And a certain kind of approach to authorial intentionality fuses those in ways that I think are theologically and hermeneutically unfortunate. 
Um, so it's the language here is a ruler who comes from of old, from eternity. Um, and, I, and I would say, you know, probably most scholars would view that as the kind of hyperbolic language that you use about any kind of royal uh, figure. He's an ancient pedigree. Yeah, or, he's got an know. ancient pedigree. He comes from a long time ago. Um, and so and I think in the commentary, I say something like, can you read it that way? And the answer is yes, you can. Do you have to read it that way? No. Interestingly enough, I think Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, uses these same appellations from of old, everlasting, to describe Adonai, uh, Tetragrammaton. Um, so there, there's something here that seems to be at play. Um, and it's remarkable to read people like Anderson and Friedman, their anchor Bible commentary on Micah. Or um, I think maybe even uh, Hillers goes this way as well to say, actually, Christian readings on this are not, uh, out, out of step with the actual nature of the language itself. Um, now, pe- people not, might not be persuaded, but the, the, the language has to be dealt with here. And you, can you do it in some sort of hyperbolic trope of ancient Near Eastern? You can, but there also seems to be canonically something more going on, especially when you link this to the language of Deuteronomy. Yeah, and the language continues. I mean, if you read on in the next two verses, three and four, Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. (laughs) Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And then he goes on to say, and they shall live secure, and he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. I mean, all of those, all of that imagery and language that picks up in the Gospels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're coming to the Bible, with what I would call overly historicist sensibilities that, lead, that, that, that by the nature of the task requires you to leave the text in its original setting so that what it means is what it meant then, period. Well, then, and then that's, I mean, that's not just the liberals. I mean, that, that's an evangelical hermeneutical instinct as well. If, if that's the approach, then you're, you're going to sit uncomfortable uh, to the ways in which texts also anticipate something larger than the frame of reference of what their original audience could have understood. Um, and this was where the truth, I mean, it's, it's so, it seems to me it's kind of basic now. I'm, I used to be real defensive about this. Now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm ready to fight a little bit. Um, I mean, it, the, the nature of this is, um, is the way in which the church understands the very nature of the Bible. I mean, what, what is the Bible? Well, it's, it's not just a, a record of something back then, and that's not to drive a wedge between history and, and our reading but it's to recognize that all of that is caught up within some sort of larger eschatological view of time that God is dealing with. Great. In Micah 6, verse 8, the text gives us a famous verse on God's requirement. Okay. He has told you, O mortal, O Adam, right, in the Hebrew. uh, In the Greek, it's anthropon, right, the human being. He has told you, Adam, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Um, How do you think we should interpret God's expectations outlined in this verse, especially in light of the previous verses, which seem to denigrate the value of sacrifices or maybe they're misappropriated sacrifices or what? And what are the challenges of applying these requirements in our kind of context today? Yeah. And I'm conscious that my answers have gone longer than they're supposed to. So, so you can, sorry, <laughs> sorry, fellas. Um, and and so keep keep us on track here. But sure. I think you have to press even behind the whole, the religious dynamics of what the people are saying and what they're how they're willing to broker with the Lord to the first verse. This is where again gospel and and redemption seems to be preceding uh, the call to human agency. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let let the hills hear your voice. Um, hear, hear, ye mountains of the Lord, this indictment. So what's the indictment? Well, verse 3, O oh, my people, that's covenantal language. What have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. me I, we won't read all that, but that, that's worth sitting with. It's a classic parent question. I thought, oh, okay, so um, you know, a, a child's complaining. I, I'll pull this line out sometimes. Maybe, maybe you guys do this for your kids. Uh, so let, let me kind of get a, a sense of what's so bad. Like, is it the fact that you have all the meals you could want provided for you? You never wonder where you're going to sleep. You get to play ball. We pay for all of that. Um, there's even some entertainment in your life. Uh, so, so answer me, like, what's so rough here? I mean, that, that's kind of the dynamic. How have, how have I wearied you? And what does he give them? He gives them a history of their redemption. I, I mean, you're, you're my child. You're my people. Um, so that, 
that sets up Micah. I think without this, Micah six eight be, can become um, a, 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 a it can become a kind of a call to pulling yourself up by your moral bootstraps. That's not linked to the primacy of the gospel, right? So I think that's at play here. Um, and then of course you have this the the a kind of classic prophetic resistance to religious ritual apart from um, the heart. Right, the, the the whole person. Um, so it's not. I, I don't think the prophets are playing themselves over against ritual. That, that's an overreading, but it's against ritual, as if there's a kind of contractual thing that's happening between us and Lord. If we do the rituals, then He's on our side, and He's saying here, no, there's there's larger things, and and not everything in Micah six eight is self evident. Like the last phrase, to walk circum. I, I got the King James in me on this one. To walk circumspectly with your God, um, to walk humbly with your God. I think a lot of translations will say, I think it's not, it's not immediately clear what's being called for there. But my sense in my own reading, what I kind of went forward in the commentary, was to say this is a call to walk in, in, in circumspect reflection on the reality of the living God, which would take into account the narrative that precedes this. In other words, for you to do justice and mercy requires a reflective, circumspect um, self-critical engagement of your own basic instincts in light of the larger story of God's redeeming work in the history of Israel and the history of the church. It's why, I mean, very basically we would say that's why we go to church. We go to church to worship the living God. And we also go to church to have our narratives reoriented again and again. The, 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 the gospel story is not about my biography primarily. It's about the work of God in the world, and I'm being drawn into that, which includes love God, love neighbor. So that oops, sorry, go ahead. Uh, that last yes. part of the, we were both just dying to <laughs> jump oh, yes. in here. This is thrilling. Uh, so that last part of the verse about walk humbly with your God, you're reading that as an encouragement not to put the first part of the verse on a bumper sticker and just understand it by itself. Unfortunately, that's what often happens: is the first part of the the verse, do justice, or maybe do justice and love kindness, gets on the bumper sticker, and we don't get the reminder not to put it on a bumper sticker on the bumper sticker itself. Okay, you are we going to go this road? You really want to do this? <laughs> yeah, let's okay. do it. <laughs> I mean, this is my reform side coming out, all right? And I and it's ensconced in the Anglican Articles of Religion, and it's also ensconced in the best, I think, of the Protestant tradition. Um, oh, this is going to be hard to swallow. But good works done apart from faith actually serve your damnation. Right? It's a, Those are acts of superbia, of pride. So if you're just doing the bumper sticker stuff as an act of self-congratulation or um, I don't want to be like those people over there, the, um, can we use it? the deplorables over there, if, that, if that's the dynamic that's at play, absent this circumspect walking with God, which, and this is, again, the best of the Reformation tradition, what does that entail? Knowledge of God and knowledge of myself. True knowledge of who God is. And the knowledge of God shines a light on the knowledge of who I really am. Who am I? I'm the person at the beginning of Micah 6. I'm the one who, by God's grace, has been called as my people. Um, the, 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 the heavy, fancy theological language I like to deploy on this is covenant ontology. Your being is a being that resides in Christ. That's who you are. That's a, that, that's a circumspect walking before God, recognizing who he is and who I am. That can unleash you then to love God and love neighbor. And I think we need to be able to say, and when you do that, it makes God happy. Like that pleases God to do that, but not when it's done apart from faith. Do you think also, I'm wondering what you think of this, you know, the people come and they ask, right? So they, they're asking these questions in verse six, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? What shall I come before him or shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And so they're like, oh, should, is this what you want, God? Should I bring you this and this and that and that and, you know, pile on all these things? And then is this kind of like where the professor tells the student it's in the syllabus? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he has told you, you know already. <laughs> is that what's no going on? No big reveal here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, again, and that's where, going back to Jeremias at the beginning, this is where Micah 6, which begins a new section, 6 and 7, 4, 5, 6, and 7, is tipping and tucking back into the main dynamics of chapters one through three, which are what? 
love God, love your neighbor. So for sure. Yeah, I've, not only have I yeah. already told you, I've already told you in this book. Right. Like, like right. this is already up and running in the dynamics of this prophecy already. Right. So these questions are kind of yeah. they're ridiculous, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, so Micah seven eighteen, the text speaks of God's forgiveness. So we have, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing mm. over the transgression of the remnant of your possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in showing clemency. Now, how do we reconcile this? with all of the language about judgment earlier in the book. And one of the things I've noticed as we've been going through the minor prophets in this podcast is over and over again, our last question is often similar to this, where you get all this judgment in these books and then at the end, this moment of hope and redemption. Yeah. So there's a canonical question here as well, I think. So how do you reconcile this, this verse and this, what it represents in this final passage with the judgment in the rest of the book? Uh, judgment intends to be restorative. Um, it's not a cul-de-sac. Um, and judgment and mercy are ingredient to the very character of the living God. So what you have here in Micah 7, very interesting as it leads into Nahum 1, are the appeal to those character traits of God that are revealed in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, where the Lord reveals his name. Think about this. Moses asks to see God's glory. And what does the Lord do? He, the ultimate answer to that, I think, and that's a tricky text there, but the ultimate answer is, not only am I going to let you see, I'm going to cause you to hear, to understand. And the Lord gives an exposition of his own name. The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger, quick to mercy. Um, I visit my, my chesed to the thousandth generation, but I by, by no means clear the guilty. Um, so this is where Christian theology is really important, right? God, God's not composed of parts. His severity and his mercy are not, um, creating some sort of schizophrenia within the divine being. He is single and operates in the singleness of his being so that his mercy and his severity flow fully from the singularity of who he is. Um, so I, th I think that language of a severe mercy, that, that actually ca captures it. God's merciful and he's severe, but the whole um, course of the prophetic word, even into the, into the modern mor moment, is a call to repent and return. Well, what are the conditions that would allow repentance and returning to be effective at all? It's the character of God revealed here. He's quick to forgive. He, he I mean, we know he runs off the porch to the prodigal son. That's that's the care. That's how we pick God out in the Bible of a lineup of other competing gods. He is quick to forgive, but he by no means clears the guilty. It, judgment is, and, and of course, we know in Christian theology this finds its culmination in the cross. Where, where do we see the severity of God and the mercy of God on fullest display? We see both of them in, in their resplendent and horrifying aspects in the cross. Jesus is receiving the severity of judgment, but we see the overwhelming character of God's mercy there in display. So those dynamics of God's mercy and his severity, I think, are necessary the one to the other. Great. Well... We end each episode, Mark, with asking oh, our God. guest to give us some kind of recommendation, <laughs> a blurb of some sort. It could be, you know, a book. It could be a book if you want to be, in, the, you know, more academic in your recommendation. Oh, goodness. But it could be something like, I don't know, what have we had? Like horse mats uh, yeah, one um, time. We had soap. The duct tape wallet duct tape that we wall talked about all of last <laughs> season. Yeah. I did just get some hog casings in the mail for the, the sausage and salami um, work that I'm planning to do on Thanksgiving. Stay tuned. Uh, oh. this is, this is, you make your own sausage and salami? That's the plan. So <laughs> you I'm, haven't done this before. I've done a prosciutto before. Like okay. I've done my own prosciutto. It hung for a year and a half at my house. The joke in the family is I my we, we finally cut the prosciutto, and um, I handed a piece to my eldest son. I said, we're going to watch you. <laughs> if you fall over, then none of us will eat it, but we'll, we'll see you first. Um, How did it go? I, uh, it was really good. Yeah. It was kind of surprisingly good, yeah. Um, real So... A year and a half, though. Good grief. That's it's crazy. Time. Like, I hang, hung it on my porch. I, mean, I, I loved this pig leg for a year and a half. Man. It, was, it was serious. Um, no, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I, I read kind of broadly, eclectically, I, and you guys probably can appreciate this. It's often now more rating than reading. Like, I'm just kind of in a lot of things at once. I, I, will, I will say just a quick novel. I, I'm always behind on this, but uh, Eugene Vodolaskin's Loris, this um, Russian novelist, fascinating kind of recapture of enchantment within drawing from the medieval world to recapture enchantment for our world. I'm kind of into that stuff right now. Um, and, and then also um, Ian McGilchrist. I mean, I, 
I, I have, um, he, he wrote a work uh, 10 years ago called, uh, no, longer than that, called The Master and Its Emissary. And it's just published his big two volume magnum opus, The Matter with Things, which is this fascinating combination of neuroscience, the history of the philosophical tradition, all wrapped up with sort of modern understandings of truth and the relation of the brain to the world. It, it's, it's fascinating, you know, and, and, the, and the basic idea is the modern world has atomized and broken things down, but the master is meant to be the right brain, which puts everything together in some meaningful whole. And so this whole sort of notion of our schizophrenic moment, our therapeutic moment, um, I've, I have found what he is doing to be um, really insightful to kind of understand some of the dilemmas of our current moment. Well, thank you, Mark, and, and thank you for the ways that in this conversation, the hall casing, that was the yeah, we're we're going to encourage people to go out and make your own prosciutto <laughs> or uh, any, <clears throat> any other kind of meat product you'd like to go make on your own. Uh, but also, I'm fascinated by the last book that you mentioned and it, the way that it reflects what you've done in this conversation, which you've both kind of broken down, Mike, and helped us walk through specific parts, but then put it together into its larger canonical context, which is a helpful way to read and understand the text. So thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you to our live studio audience here at Beeson Divinity School at Samford University. We appreciate you being here to um, witness this live conversation <laughs> with Mark Ginolette, which may be like nothing you've witnessed before. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And if you get a chance, uh, either here in the room or if you're listening out in the interwebs, uh, please do um, give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or share the podcast with somebody else. That helps get word out about the show. And uh, for those of you who have profited from Mark's insight in the text, there are many other episodes with other great scholars who have put hours, years into understanding these texts to help you walk through some of the difficult issues that you may face in them. So check out the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. This episode is co-sponsored by Samford University and the Alabama Humanities Alliance, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this episode do not necessarily represent those of the Alabama Humanities Alliance, the National Endowment for the Humanities, or Samford University. Thanks also to the Faculty Success Center and our student assistants for their help with production and promotion.